let me talk to you about uh, a topic that I've been researching now for some years. Um, so I have had an interest in business models for many years, uh, uh, since approximately 2004. And I've also published quite a number of uh, papers on business models. Um, and more recently, I became interested in unit economics. And uh, I'll, I'll share the rationale for that with you in a minute. Um, I hope you can all see my presentation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, this uh, uh, the, the 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 research on uh, unit economics, which is basically profitability per unit, uh, it's actually a an accounting one hundred and one concept because uh, I am a BCom graduate and we you know I would say you know. I studied this in my high school, basically, you know, the, the basic uh, ideas of contribution margins and so on. But surprisingly, um, entrepreneurs and investors seem to ignore this uh, accounting 101 concept. And so we decided to, to do some research and apply it to, to business models. Um, so this uh, specific project on unit economics began around 2018, uh, when I was invited to Hungary to Budapest to uh, deliver a, a doctoral seminar. And there, uh, you know, um, this lady on the right, she, uh, Dora Horvath, she was a student, a doctoral student, and she uh, and I, we started discussing business models. And uh, we decided to focus on this particular aspect of unit economics that for some time I had been concerned was being ignored by both uh, entrepreneurs and investors. And then we roped in my former colleague, uh, Professor Ramon Casadesus Masanel, uh, who was uh, who overlapped with me for one year at ESA Business School, and he's uh, I would say one of the leading uh, thinkers on business models in the world, very widely published, and um, an authority on the topic I would say. So uh, we were fortunate that he decided to join the team, and uh, our work resulted in. Uh, a paper that was published in the February issue of the MIT Sloan Management Review. Uh, the title is When Losing Money is Strategic and When It Isn't. So um, let me set the scene, okay, by sharing with you some examples of companies that have been founded by very, very bright people, you know, with very advanced degrees, and that have also been backed by uh, some very hard nosed investors. And yet these companies have made some very basic mistakes, right? So Movie Pass was a company that was founded in 2010, and it actually received an award for being one of the most disruptive apps in 2012. Uh, it raised a lot of venture capital funding, but basically the idea was to set up a subscription service for moviegoers. And the initial pricing of the subscription was $50 a month, and you could watch an unlimited number of movies uh, if you paid the subscription price. Uh, they later dropped the uh, subscription to between $25 and $40, depending on the location in the US. And finally, you know, in a, in a, in a bout of aggression, I would say, they dropped it to $9.95 per month uh, for, two, uh, for one 2D movie per day, okay? The moviegoers were delighted, and within a month, the number of subscriptions reached 400,000. The problem was that MoviePass could not convince the movie theater chains in the US to either give it a commission or give it a discount. So basically, MoviePass was paying between $9 and $12 for each movie ticket. Um, and it was charging customers only $9.95 a month. And no, no wonder it was hemorrhaging cash. So it tried a number of uh, iterations with its, uh, with its uh, pricing, uh, raising prices, restricting the number of movies that uh, 
movie goers could go to uh, and charging uh, a premium of six dollars for new release fil films etc but none of these uh, strategies worked and finally uh, the company actually shut down in january of 2020 okay after having burned tens of millions of dollars another example uh, a two-sided platform that brought together uh, customers who wanted their homes cleaned with home cleaning services providers. And they raised 38 million in 2013. A typical mistake with venture capital uh, backed ventures, as you all know, is the push for growth. Okay, so they opened their services in 30 cities in the US, Canada, and the UK in less than six months, thanks to the money that they had raised. Now, the pricing was they had to pay the home cleaning services providers $85 for two and a half hours of cleaning. This was the average price. They, they were average cost for them. And they offered a promotional price to households of $19 only. Okay. So you could say that this was a strategy for them to acquire new customers. Uh, and they promoted this heavily on promotion sites such as Groupon. But the problem is that once households had used the promotional offer, they did not rebook the service. Only 15 to 20% of them did. And after six months, only 10% of the original customers were still using the service. So this company also shut down in 2015. And finally, an example from, so here basically what I'm saying is that the, one reason for failure was that the customer acquisition costs were too high relative to the customer lifetime value. I'll talk about this a little more later in the presentation. A third example is uh, OFO, a bike sharing company, okay? Um, they raised 2.2 billion with some of the most uh, marquee investors in, the, in, in China, including Alibaba. And there were also some um, Silicon Valley venture capital funds that have offices in China that invested in the company. They uh, also expanded rapidly, similar to Homejoy, maybe even faster than Homejoy, entered their 100th city globally within seven months after opening in the first city, which was Beijing. It was a non-docking model. Just, just uh, you know, just to explain that if you if you picked up a bike, you picked up a bike using a QR code, which you scanned on your on your cell phone, and the you paid um, digitally. You paid using your mobile phone. You paid one RMB for each each hour that you use the bike. So you, if you picked it up, let's say outside of, outside a metro station, you could drop it off anywhere you liked. There was no concept of a docking station where you had to drop off the bike. You could drop it off anywhere that you found, found it convenient to do so. And they, uh, unfortunately, so they, there was another company called uh, Mobike that, that was also a bike sharing platform that was the pioneer in, in China. And Ofo decided to follow the strategy of sourcing cheaper bicycles than its rivals. Mobike was not the only one, which resulted in higher repair costs for Ofo. And the model was that customers paid a deposit of 99 RMB, which is about a thousand rupees in, in the, at the current exchange rates. And later they, this, this deposit was in, increased to about 2000 rupees. And the price, as I said, was one RMB per hour, roughly 10 rupees per hour of bike usage. And it was just not generating enough profits. Uh, it was a hyper competitive market, which made it very difficult for them to raise prices. And their focus was not on the profitability by, for bicycle uh, or profitability per customer. They were focusing on the total number of rides and they also shut down. So what you're seeing here is one of many 
bicycle graveyards in China. This is not the only one. There are, there are many, many where companies like Ofo that shut down, you know, the bicycles were collected and dumped in a site like this because the city, uh, the municipal governments in the of the cities like Shenzhen and Shanghai were getting more and more frustrated that they had useless bikes cluttering the pavements. So what is the problem here? The problem is that many high growth ventures make poor pricing and resource allocation decisions due to a fundamental lack of understanding of the financial aspects of their business model. Startups, especially those backed by VCs that are pushing for high growth, frequently make losses at the venture level. And these losses seem to increase with scale. We are seeing that in India, you know, uh, at the time Flipkart was acquired by Walmart, uh, you know, you, you could track the, the, the growth of the company and the more it grew, the more losses it was making. Um, so the key question that we need to understand is are the losses healthy or unhealthy? Some of the losses in some ventures can be attributed to the upfront investment in growth. And so we refer to these as healthy losses, right? The, the venture is making a positive contribution margin per unit. And, and the losses are attributable, as I said just now, to the upfront investment in growth. And therefore with scale, the losses can be converted to profit. The overheads will be absorbed, you know, as the company scales and the losses will be converted to profits. What are unhealthy losses? Unhealthy losses are those where the venture is fundamentally making a negative contribution margin per unit. And this often, almost always actually, reflects a fundamental problem with the business model. And scale in this case is not a solution. It will actually make things even worse. Now, there are some exceptions to what I've just said. Okay. When are losses per unit not necessarily unhealthy? So the first case is where the product or service clearly benefits from economies of scale or learning what we call learning curve effects, right? And so, for example, we know that uh, electronics hardware manufacturing is very, the costs of electronics hardware are very susceptible to volumes. So as you ramp up volumes, be it computers or iPads or phones or any other type of uh, electronic hardware, the costs decline very sharply, okay? So this is actually a proven, um, proven fact, okay? There is abundant evidence to support that costs in electronics hardware manufacturing drop sharply with scale. And Xiaomi, for example, which is very big in India, the Mi, the Mi phones, the Redmi and so on, they count on this, and I'm going to illustrate to you very soon with a, with a graph how they think about um, unit economics uh, in the uh, context of electronics hardware production. A second case where uh, unhealthy losses may be acceptable is when the company is sure that with large volumes, additional sources of revenue will emerge, okay? So this was what MoviePass was banking on. MoviePass was, they had this belief that with a significant growth in the number of subscribers, that data would become valuable, right? And therefore movie theaters and, and businesses that are close to movie theaters, such as restaurants and bars and so on, would be willing to pay MoviePass for the data. But unfortunately, this assumption did not materialize. And very often, this, um, this uh, you know, belief of banking on additional sources of revenue to emerge for, for data or for other, uh, other uh, you know, parts of the business, uh, usually this is not a well-founded well assumption. A third case uh, where initial losses may be acceptable 
uh, even if the even if the unit uh, contribution margin per unit is negative, is in businesses that are susceptible to very strong network effects. So, in multi-sided platforms, you need to think a little differently about unit economics. And if we have time, I can talk a little more about this. Okay, uh, but eventually, even in multi-sided platforms, unit economics do become important because the network effects are not uniform with scale. They actually they are very very strong in the initial stages of growth of the venture, and they decline with time. Just to give you an example, if I am living in Chennai, I want a, a ride-hailing platform that has a large number. Of, of cars. This is called a cross-site network event, right? So I'm a user of Uber or Ola, and I want a platform that has tens of thousands of cars. But for me, the value of uh, going from 10 to 20,000 cars is lower than the value of going from zero to 10,000 cars. Okay. So this is the point I'm trying to make is that the returns the, the, the network effects are diminish, diminishing with scale. This is the example I was talking to you about with uh, Xiaomi. Right? Xiaomi, uh, this is actually a, a real example. Uh, the Mi phone, I don't remember exactly which year it was launched. <coughs> they priced it below their production cost at $326 because they knew that costs would sharply decline with scale. And the decline was so sharp that some years later, you know, in the later stages of the life cycle of this model, of this phone model, Xiaomi was able to actually drop prices again. Okay. Um, as I said, there is very strong evidence to back this, but very often uh, entrepreneurs are not working with facts. They are working with assumptions, which is okay, right? It's okay for entrepreneurs to start off with assumptions, but they need to test their assumptions. And uh, without testing their assumptions, uh, very often it's only hope, which, which does not really materialize. Right? So what is what exactly is unit economics? So let's define it. So by unit economics, we mean contribution margin per unit. Okay, the revenues per unit, for, for a unit, for a particular unit, minus the costs that you would avoid if you stopped offering that unit. So one insight that we uh, have provided in this article is that a business can, can be looking at multiple units. Uh, it, is, it is not true that there is only one unit that you should look at. So in the case of MoviePass, for example, they could look at subscription as a unit, right? Is a single subscription profitable in terms of its contribution margin, in terms of a typical moviegoer, right? Um, are we making a positive contribution margin uh, on a single subscription? Clearly, they were not. This was a major problem, right? You can look at a customer as a unit, right? Is a customer profitable in terms of the contribution margin over, over the customer's lifetime? So here we look at uh, a very widely known concept by marketers. It's called customer lifetime value. And we compare it to the customer acquisition cost, CAC. CLV to CSE ratio. And the rule of thumb, you know, that venture capitalists follow is that this ratio should be at least three to one. The higher the better, right? For a restaurant, uh, the outlet, uh, let's say for a restaurant chain, the outlet can be a unit for a McDonald's or, or, a, or a, you know, um, uh, any other QSR chain like Kentucky Fried Chicken or whatever. An outlet can be a unit for Sangeetas, right? Or Murugan Idli. An outlet can be a unit, a meal can be a unit, and a customer can be a unit. For a ride hailing platform, you know, each individual ride can be a unit. Again, a customer can be a unit, or a city can be a unit. Should I open in a new city or not, right? Should I start offering my services, let's say, in a tier two or a tier three town? Will it make sense for me to do it? And in B2B businesses also, an individual sale can be a unit or a customer can be a unit. 
So looking at a venture from the perspective of multiple units is what we researchers refer to as, as triangulation, right? So if a, a business is looking good, you know, solid from multiple units perspective, then, you know, you can be more confident about the robustness of your business model. 